During the fall of 1918, the city of Philadelphia held a war bonds parade against all public health guidance. On September 28th, the Liberty Loans Parade brought a crowd of 200,000 to Broad Street to raise funds for World War I. As Philadelphians of all backgrounds shouted and cheered, the invisible virus jumped from person to person, commencing the flu's stranglehold on the city that would lead to Philadelphia's deadliest winter on record. Within weeks, the city was gripped with a dual virus a deadly flu that was accelerated by false information fueled by fear. 72 hours later, all 32 hospitals in Philadelphia were at maximum capacity and an overwhelming amount of deaths soon followed. Much of these deaths were the result of intentional and unintentional attempts to undermine factual health guidance of the time. This is known as misinformation and disinformation two key terms integral to understanding the flu pandemic of 1918. With definitions, we will clearly lay down guidelines that will operate within during this three-part series. Disinformation, defined as false information deliberately and often covertly spread to influence public opinion or obscure the truth, often with intent to harm. Misinformation, defined as incorrect or misleading information, usually with the intent to help. Words of mass destruction, influenced influenza. The exact origin of the virus, commonly known as Spanish flu, is unknown but the first case was documented in Kansas in 1918. Over the next two years, the flu infected 500 million people, killing at least 50 million of them globally and 675,000 domestically. The virus was a strain of the H1N1 flu with common symptoms of strong fever, nausea, aches, discoloration in the face, and difficulty breathing from fluid-filled lungs. The virus also left survivors susceptible to greater infection. As a result, many came down with severe pneumonia, which was often the ultimate killer. It is important to note that science and germ theory were still in their early stages of development, so even experts of the time were unsure of the cause and how to effectively stop the spread. This evoked considerable fear among citizens. Okay, so now that we know the severity of the flu and what it can do, why would it be illegal to report it to the public? While World War I had been raging in Europe since 1914, with the introduction to the flu in 1918, the strategy and approach to the war significantly changed. The global struggle for power led to the increase of tribalism within warring countries. In turn, this led to the centering of critical health information to avoid showing weakness to their adversaries. The restricted knowledge about the flu reduced public awareness and allowed it to spread rapidly, causing millions of avoidable deaths. In fact, the very name Spanish flu is a misnomer, resulting from wartime censorship during the years of warfare. Virtually every country involved engaged in information suppression, a common tactic of government-sponsored disinformation. However, Spain remained neutral throughout the war and allowed its press to operate freely. So when King Alfonso XIII came down with the flu in the spring of 1918, it was widely reported and the false impression of Spain as the epicenter stuck. The United States was no exception to the tactic of controlling the press. On May 16, 1918, President Woodrow Wilson signed the Sedition Act. In Section 3 of the text, the Act states that whoever, when the United States is at war, shall willingly utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States or the Constitution of the United States shall be punished by a fine of not more than $10,000 or imprisoned for not more than 20 years. By making it illegal to publish anything that put the country and the war effort in a negative light, the Sedition Act caused a disruptive ripple effect on the whole country and especially Philadelphia. This manifested during the Liberty Loans Parade in September. 
Though aware of the huge risk, city officials refused to cancel the parade because it was seen as essential to raising funds for the war and keeping patriotic spirits high. Although there was pushback and extensive reasons to cancel, the city refused and stated that the virus was already contained. In order to get a better understanding of what occurred that September in Philadelphia, we spoke to an expert from the Muti Museum at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. My name is Nancy Hill. I am the museum manager at the Muter Museum. I was the project manager on Spit Spread Staff, the influenza pandemic of 1918 through 1919. So the story of the flu in Philadelphia really starts down at the Navy Yard. So I think when we think about pandemics today, we there's a certain kind of um, assumption made about global travel, which wasn't the case in 1918. 1918, it wasn't common for people to be moving around both, you know, domestically within the country and internationally the way that we do today. The exception in 1918 was that it was wartime. And so a lot of people were moving between training camps across the country and also moving, you know, between the U.S. and Europe and other parts of the world because of the war. So in Philadelphia, the flu was really introduced to the city via the Navy Yard by through a ship that came from Boston carrying military personnel. That flu-ridden ship arrived in Philadelphia's Navy Yard on September 7th, personally delivering the lethal killer that would plague the city for an upcoming winter. At first, the flu was believed to be contained to the port, with numerous short articles in local newspapers claiming that it was all under control and the virus would soon be eradicated. Business as usual was clearly the message, all was well. Business as usual was not the reality. All was not well. The virus had seeped from the port and exploded into the general population of the city by mid-September. Nevertheless, the city continued insisting that the virus was contained, saying on September 20th in the evening public ledger that, The fact that the disease was not reported makes it difficult for health officials to estimate exactly the number of cases in the city now. Some say that several thousand is a conservative figure. There's a slight possibility health authorities will declare quarantine against the disease. Naval authorities believe today they will have the epidemic well in hand and will be able to stamp it out completely within two weeks. The city had additional incentive to downplay the severity of the virus because of the all-important Liberty Loans Parade at the end of the month. It was the third parade of its kind in the year, and it was critical to the city on meeting its fundraising quota. About 200,000 people came out on South Broad Street, and within 72 hours of that event, all 32 hospitals that existed in the city at the time were full. And so we can't say with any kind of certainty that the parade was the catalyst for the spread of flu in Philadelphia. It was certainly a bad idea. Within two weeks, mortality skyrocketed, and over the next six weeks, 12,000 Philadelphians died from the virus. That would be on average 286 people within the city dying every single day. However, the parade wasn't solely to blame. Additional war-related factors led to the rapid spread during the fall and winter. To support the war effort on the front lines of Europe, the military recruited 75% of Philadelphia's medical workers, leaving the city vulnerable and hospitals unable to provide care. The population of Philadelphia had grown to 1.7 million people. Much of these people lived in unsanitary row homes with three to five families to a single house and made a living manufacturing war materials in industrial sites around the city. In these factory buildings, laborers worked in close quarters with little ventilation and poor hygiene standards, creating ideal conditions for the spread of the virus. As October 1918 dragged on, the situation in Philadelphia became more and more dire, with people dying left and right. Bodies piled up in the streets from overflowing hospitals. Henry Hagee, an artist from just outside of the city in Montgomery County, writes in his journal, October 5th, 1918, Nathaniel Landes died today. All hotels and salons around here and in Philadelphia closed for 10 days by Board of Health on account of the Spanish influenza. October 6th, 1918, today all Sunday schools and 
church services were closed on account of the Spanish influenza, also known as the flu. October 7th, 1918. Rain. Yesterday I did not see one automobile. Many people are sick and many are dying. October 25th, 1918. Undertakers may not open any caskets at places of burial, and funerals cannot go into the churches on account of the flu. The sentiments displayed in these journal entries were shared by all Philadelphians. No matter who you were or where you lived, you couldn't escape the flu's death grip. I don't want to harp too much about how um, traumatic it got at a certain point, but your neighbors are dying and piling up to the streets. You're going to try anything that you can to keep this from happening to you and your family and the people around you. And so most of the misinformation and confusion that I've seen is mostly people just trying anything that they can to keep this from happening to them and their family. Misinformed home remedies spread like wildfire. Out of desperation, people most often turned to whiskey. While whiskey itself had no medical qualities, it would make users lethargic, causing individuals to remain at home and drink fluids to hydrate. Along with whiskey, other traditional preventatives were common. These included garlic, red pepper sandwiches, raw onions, and asphidity bags. Asphidity bags were little sacks of pungent herbs that were common in Appalachia. These pre-germ theory treatments were ineffective but eased the fear among some. Then that went to see the doctor, she'd just say, go home and take aspirin and drink plenty of water, any kind of liquid. Panic around being infected was exploited by corporations and companies with advertisements offering useless cures and preventatives to the flu. This created greater desperation and mistrust among Philadelphians who struggled to identify reliable information but were willing to try anything that might help. This fear coincided with the war also manifesting in anti-German rhetoric that blamed German immigrants for the surge in flu cases and deaths, some going as far to claim biological warfare. The stereotyping and discrimination also extended to Black Philadelphians. Medicine has, is responsible for all kinds of racism in a lot of ways, but there was a, an incorrect assumption that African Americans were immune to the flu, which is not true, obviously. But because these communities were kind of insular and didn't have the same mobility as a lot of white communities did, there were num their infection numbers were different. Certainly still a lot of African Americans dying of the flu, especially in Philadelphia. The heightened patriotism wasn't all bad though. It also had the effect of bringing people together and working collaboratively. So when the hospitals, funeral homes, and cemeteries were overrun, those who were uninfected and strong stepped up by collecting and burying bodies. Seminary students specifically would go out with a horse and a cart to pick up bodies along the streets. Reverend Thomas Brennan describes the Holy Cross Cemetery. Who can describe the scenes that met the eye during these harrowing days? Everywhere, in every direction, fresh graves swept away from the gaze of the onlooker. causing the well-kept cemetery to resemble a shell-torn field of battle. A constant procession of hearses pressed at the gates. Hearses and substitutes for hearses. Newspaper wagons, trucks, coal carts, and ash wagons. The odor of rotting corpses stenched the air. Death was everywhere. As the new year arrived and the spring of 1919 emerged, flu cases in Philadelphia gradually decreased to negligible levels and normalcy mostly returned. However, the city was left with a deep scar. About 40% of the population had been infected, with 20,000 dead in the city. A clear result of the botched response to it, aided by rampant misinformation and disinformation. While the true reason for the eradication of the disease in Philadelphia is unclear, 
Experts speculate that the required level of herd immunity was reached within the city because of the high infection rate and established immunity in older populations from previous flu outbreaks about 30 years prior. To avoid showing weakness, there was never any public acknowledgement of the flu's presence within the country by the federal government. Even when the mass graves grew common and the President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, was infected, the federal government disinformed the public. As we see in Philadelphia during 1918 and 1919, misinformation and disinformation can manifest in a variety of ways. Whether it's a malicious government campaign or an inconspicuous online article, falsities of any kind universally have the potential to harm. Weaponized information is a pattern that we can trace throughout history violently repeating itself time and time again. Presently, lies and fiction flood our social media feed, making them more prevalent than ever. At a time where dishonesty spreads so much faster than the truth, how do we keep ourselves grounded in reality and away from the alluring eyes of deception?